Bob, are we okay? Let's start. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Honorable Minister of Trade and Industry, Republic of Angola, my fellow co-hosts, Ambassador Bob Ray, Permanent Representative of Canada, and Ms. Isabel Durant, Acting Secretary General of UNCTAD, High Representative uh, Portney Ratre, UN Agency Principals, uh, Representatives of the Private Sector and of the Academia, Distinguished Speakers, Excellencies, Distinguished Colleagues, and my dear friends, good afternoon from Geneva. On behalf of Ambassador Bob Ray, Ms. Isabel Durant, and myself, I have the honor to welcome you all to this high level webinar on productive capacities induced structural transformation on the road to graduation with momentum. At the outset, I would like to commend the efforts of the Acting Secretary General of UNCTAD and her entire team for bringing us together for this important event. The Istanbul uh, program faction had an ambitious target to graduate half of the LCs by 2020. Although this target was not fully achieved, we saw considerable progress. Within the last decade, four countries have graduated and as many as 16 others have moved to different stages of graduation. In the last annual review of the CDP, my own country, Bangladesh, along with Lao PDR and Nepal were recommended for graduation. ECOSOC has already endorsed this recommendation. Excellencies, dear colleagues, graduation, no doubt, is an important milestone in the development trajectory of any LDC. It demonstrates tangible progress in socioeconomic development measured against a set of well-defined indexes. Yet, graduation has a flip side. By default, graduation means an abrupt loss of a variety of special and preferential support measures and flexibilities. This can cause a serious macroeconomic shock to the graduated countries. Furthermore, these countries are also highly vulnerable to other kinds of shocks and crises. The WTO, UNCTAD, CDP, and OHR LLS have undertaken several studies in recent times and revealed the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the LDCs and a sharp decline in external financing and their slower recovery compared to the rest of the world. The LDCs are bearing a heavy brunt of the crisis because they lack structural transformation and productive capacity building. Their economies primarily rely on basket of exportable goods and services, tourism, or remittances. They are also structurally vulnerable to climate change and natural disasters to a disproportionate magnitude. Against this backdrop, trans structural transformation in agriculture and the manufacturing and services sector can create new opportunities for the LDCs. This can shift resources and production frontiers from low value added to higher value added areas. In turn, this can enable the LDCs not only to accelerate economic growth and sustainable development, but also to put them strongly on the graduation track. The challenges of st structural transformation in the LDCs, however, are quite daunting. They have limited or no access to modern technologies, and they face high challenges to access credit and unfavorable legal and regulatory frameworks to market access. There are also infrastructural human resources and investment challenges. To overcome these constraints, they need enhanced support to diversify their products and services in order to compete at higher production frontiers in regional and global value chains. Against this backdrop, uh, today's webinar uh, aims to address some pressing questions such as which policies, strategies, and international support measures are needed to boost productive capacities and their contribution to support an inclusive process of structural transformation in the LDCs, that will enable them to reach graduation with momentum. Secondly, how can the emerging technologies be leveraged for enhanced economic diversification and structural transformation in the LDCs over the next decade? And finally, how can the next UN program of action for the LDCs to contribute to accelerate structural transformation through the expansion of productive capacities for the LDC's sustainable develop, development. We have completed the second uh, preparatory committee meeting of the LDC 5 conference last month, uh, which Bob and I co-chair. 
and where we had fruitful uh, discussions on the zero draft of the Doha program of action. The draft outcome document uh, has identified structural transformation as a key focus area. It outlines specific targets and key action areas to change the landscape of productive capacity building, infrastructure, and private sector development to integrate the LDCs better in the regional and global value chains. In parallel, we are also preparing for the UNTED 15. Today, we are privileged to have with, a, with us an excellent group of eminent persons as our speakers and discussants to reflect on these issues. We look forward to benefiting from their experiences and perspectives. I believe that today's meeting will contribute also to the LDC 5 and UNTED 15 preparatory process and outcome documents, especially with regard to the essential linkage between structural transformation and graduation with momentum. With those first few words, I would now like to move on to our panelists. And uh, I have the pleasure first to invite uh, Mr. Courtney Ratre, UST and UN High Representative for OHRLLS, and also the Secretary General of the LDC 5 Conference to deliver his opening remarks. Courtney, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Fatima. Let me at the outset make a very important point. I understand you struggling over the pronunciation of that acronym, Ambassador Fatima. OHRLLS <laughs> is a mouthful for any of us. Anyway, with that acknowledgement, let me also acknowledge Ambassador Bob Ray, the PR of Canada and my good friend, Honorable Ministers, distinguished delegates. Let me thank the organizers for this timely event, the PRs of Bangladesh and Canada, as well as UNCTAD, for inviting me to, say, to make some brief introductory remarks. I'll begin by noting at the outset that almost all LDCs in the Asia-Pacific region have met the graduation criteria at least twice and have been recommended for graduation. This progress can partly be attributed to the use of LDC-specific trade preferences and other support measures, which have helped several of them to develop manufacturing exports, especially in the textile industries. However, some of this progress has been hampered by the disruption of global value chains due to COVID-19. In addition, the expected loss of LDC-specific support measures after graduation will pose some challenges for their continued progress towards enhancing, as Ambassador Fatima said, structural transformation, and also of their ability to achieve the SDGs. As indicated in a new SG report on graduation support that has been prepared by my office, the LDC-5 conference provides a timely opportunity to introduce new and improved concrete international support measures that target the needs of graduating LDCs in particular in the areas of trade, IPR, intellectual property rights, and financing for development. We need to ensure that the development trajectory of graduating LDCs will not be disrupted and that the challenges and uncertainties experienced by graduating LDCs in achieving the 2030 Agenda are effectively addressed to ensure graduation with momentum. As such, the IATF, led by my office, the Interagency Task Force, has been providing better coordinated UN system support to graduating LDCs. We have worked collaboratively with many UN agencies and other relevant institutions to shine light on the needs of graduating LDCs. By improving the coordination of UN support to LDCs, we will not only increase our ability to address these needs of these countries, but lessen the burden on government capacities in LDCs. Enhanced UN system coordination will also enable the resident coordinators and country teams to operate as a true, quote unquote, one UN entity. So let me close with a reference to a new initiative that is taking shape after a successful pilot phase. We have, together with our UN colleagues from the CDP Secretariat of DESA, been developing a sustainable graduation support facility to respond to the increasing demands from graduating and recently graduated LDCs. The facility will provide dedicated capacity development and technical advisory support 
to prepare and manage the graduation process to ensure a smooth transition towards sustainable development in a post-COVID-19 environment. It is designed to respond directly to the needs of graduating and graduated countries, and so will operate on the basis of country demand, including in the areas of trade and productive capacity. We count on the support of LDCs and development partners to make it a success. So, Rabab, without further ado, let me give it back to you, and I look forward to the deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Courtney. Thank you for your usual uh, insightful remarks, as well as for sharing uh, updates on the way forward and how you intend to go forward in an inclusive manner to leverage productive capacity building for graduation with momentum. Thank you very much, Courtney. And you'll be with us uh, because we have the interactive uh, session later on. Uh, now, I have the pleasure to call upon another co-host, uh, Ms. Isabel Durant, the Acting Secretary General of that, to make her opening remarks. Madam Durant, you have the floor. Thank you, Rabba Fatima. So, Excellencies, uh, uh, Ambassador Fatima Rabab and Robert Ray, that who I had the pleasure to meet uh, in New York uh, uh, last July. <laughs> so happy to see you. So, and also, dear Courtney, I will stop here in order not to have to pronounce the acronym of your organization. But well, uh, Excellencies and friends, it's a pleasure, of course, for me to welcome this side event on accelerating structural transformation. And I would also like to thank the co-chair of the PrepCom for LDC5, and I know what it is, uh, PrepCom, because I'm busy with the PrepCom of the UNCTAD 15, so I know how important it is. And uh, Ambassador of Bangladesh and Canada, uh, I, I, I encourage you and I thank you for co-organizing this event, which is a testament of the importance of the debate of the modalities of graduation from the LDC category. So in two months, we will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the creation of LDC category. But unfortunately, so far, our record on assisting these countries is disappointing. While the number of LDCs more than doubled from the initial 25 to a maximum of 51 uh, in 2003, only six countries have so far graduated from the list. So thanks to high economic growth in the new millennium, as well as renewed commitment to graduation since the Istanbul Programme of Action, we are now seeing a growing number of LDCs at various stages uh, of the graduation process. And as mentioned previously, six LDCs, including Bhutan, Kiribati, Solomon Island and Tuvalu from the Asia Pacific region, plus Angola and Sao Tome and Principe, are expected to graduate in the coming uh, three years. A further three Asian LDCs, Bangladesh, Laos, PDR, and Nepal, are slated for following in 2026. However, this wave of planned graduation is accompanied by considerable challenges compounded by the uncertainties and lingering impact of COVID-19. Many LDCs are concerned that the loss of international support measures associated with LDC status will disrupt their development trajectory or lead them into a middle-income trap. So these concerns are legitimate, even if they do not apply to all LDCs equally. Various UNCTAD analysis, including our LDC reports, have shown that most LDCs have achieved the graduation point based on the development of a single sector, often commodities or tourism. Very few of them, however, have achieved significant progress in economic diversification and structural transformation. And yet, structural transformation is the basis of sustained and inclusive growth. It is also, and the COVID-19 pandemic underscores it is, the foundation of economic resilience to shocks, what just Fatima Rabat said. So if we are to ensure that graduation becomes a milestone in LDC development trajectories, we must harness it to equip graduating, graduating LDCs with a solid economic foundation for succeeding in the post-pandemic and post-graduation environment. This is what we refer to, be, to by achieving graduation with momentum. Furthermore, UNCTAD has long argued that for LDCs to achieve structural transformation and inclusive growth, they need to build productive capacities. Productive capacities measure the diverse competencies, resources, skills, 
infrastructure, technological capabilities, and institutions as country needs to produce more sophisticated goods and services. And to measure them effectively, OTAT has recently developed a Productive Capacities Index, PCI, which reveals the continuing challenges faced by LDCs and the widening gap with other developing and developed countries. With the exception of natural capital, which indicates the rich resource endowment of countries, LDCs lag well behind all the developing countries in all the categories of the PCI, namely human capital, energy, institution, structural change, private sector development, ICT, and transport networks. To make graduation a stepping stone for LDC development, we need a comprehensive strategy for graduation with momentum that places the building of productive capacity at the center. One way to do this is by systematically carrying out, carrying out productive capacity gap assessment for LDCs meeting the graduation criteria for the first time and designing policies in this basis. ONGTAT has already begun doing this for the five LDCs assessed to meet the criteria in 2021. We also need a longer and predictable transition period for graduation, as well as a new generation of ISMEs, which focus on productive capacity development as their core objective. These measures could, from the basis for self-sustaining growth towards LDC graduation and beyond, paving the way for the achievement of the SDGs, and at least not to set back on SDGs. Needless to say, UNCTAD stands ready to lend its analytical and operational support to LDC and uh, in the designing for uh, the, the strategies for graduation with momentum and be sure that we will use UNCTAD 15 as a momentum, a political momentum uh, in this regard, because of course it's next October, it's soon, and so we will try to help and to pave the way also for LDC 5 in this regard. Thank you. Uh, I thank you, Madame Duran, for your very useful remarks and also for elaborating uh, the concept of productive capacity index and how it can help with eliminating uh, the production capacity gaps. Thank you very much. Thank you also for highlighting the challenges and the systemic weaknesses of the existing structure for LDC graduation and the need for enhanced support. Thank you. We intend to remain closely engaged with UNCTAD as we prepare for LDC 5 and beyond. Thank you very much. Uh, Distinguished colleagues, excellencies, we will now turn to our panel of speakers, which includes policymakers, practitioners, and academics. We're very pleased to have them. And uh, I have the honor of first to invite His Excellency, Mr. Victor Francisco dos Santos Fernandez, Minister of Trade and Industry of the Republic of Angola, to deliver his statement. Uh, Honorable Minister, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Excellence, Ms. Rabab Fatima, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Bangladesh in the United Nations. Excellency, Mr. Kotne Rotrai, UN High Representative for LDC. Excellence, Mrs. Duran, and UNCTAD Acting Secretary General. Excellence, Mr. Hiroshi Kuniyoshi, Deputy Director General of UNIDO. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, allow me first of all to thank UNCTAD for the invitation address to participate in this important event on structural transformation and productive capacities, an important event that marks the, the reflection on the need to develop sectorial policies and reforms aimed at growth and sustainable development. I accept the kind invitation to, together with UNCTAD, given the expertise that they have in matters of trade and development, we can clarify aspects concerning existing development programs and thus identify the only way to apply reforms and feasible structures for strengthening national productive, productive capacities. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as it is the public knowledge, the Republic of Angola, due to its efforts to diversify the economy, has now over the years, and given the regional and global challenges, a new phase of development with the reorganization, modernization, 
recovery and construction of social infrastructure and training of staff at the national level, aiming to creating conditions for the country's growth on a more sustainable basis. Currently, a vast program of political, economic and social reforms are underway to improve the business environment and boost economic diversification. In the field of economic policies, we have seen advances in the balance of internal and external accounts. The budget deficits experienced since 2015 were suppressed in 2018. However, due to the effects of COVID-19 in 2020, it was again negative. It is estimated though, uh, through fiscal projections that this year we will end up with a positive budget balance. The country is also currently managing internal accounts to manage debt needs. The implementation of a more flex, uh, flexible exchange rate regime allowed for the adjustment of the exchange markets being close to balance due to stability achieved in recent months. The adjustment of the foreign exchange markets constitutes an important element of the competitiveness of Angola economy and for the increase of national production, whose results, although timid, are beginning to be visible. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for the sustained growth of the Angola economy, a set of priority sectors for investments were defined namely agriculture, food and agro, agro industry, specialized health services units, industrial transformation of forestry and forestry resources, production and distribution of energy, textiles, clothing and footwear, hotels, tourism and leisure, education, professional technical training, scientific research and innovation. Investments in the above mentioned sectors will contribute to accelerating multi sector relationships with a view to increase local content and thus levering development in the value chains, an important factor of the development of industrialization at the national level and in Africa. On the other hand, policy measures are being implemented to facilitate access to private sector financing from financial institutions with the aim of stimulating the integrated productions of national sectors. I'm talking precisely about the credit support program. This program is part of the support program for production, export diversification and import substitutions and applies to investment projects that contribute directly or indirectly to national productivity capacity. In terms of private investments, the ongoing reforms are building new confidence, strengthening institutions and contributing to improvement, to improving, sorry, the business environment, where we highlight the single investment, uh, investment window, the new investments regime, the creation of privileged spaces for implementation projects, such as free zones, industrial areas, special economic zones, etc as well as the guarantee of greater investors protection. The, comp the, competition law, the competition law was also approved. On the other hand, there is a commitment of the government to insert our country in the, in the regional, continental and global market, a factor that conditions our country to proceed with the negotiations of certain trade agreements on the occasion of the African continent, continental free trade area of the SADC free trade area and the subsequent negotiation of the economic partnership agreement with the Europe European Union. These assumptions of regional and continent continental economic integration of the Republic of Angola, subject the Angolan executive and with greater emphasis to the business class, to adaptation challenges and paradigm shifts that guarantee greater competitiveness in the context of agriculture, industrial, logistics, and distribution, as well as acting locally and thinking globally. As is very well known, the reforms could help in economic recovery, as well as mitigate the effects and or externalities of Angola's graduation from a least developed country to a middle income country in 2024. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for now, we hope that UCTAD will support our country in designing a national strategy 
of smooth transaction in order to avoid possible constraints that may occur with the erosion of preferences after the conclusion of this process. I would like to finish my, by reaffirming the government of Angola's commitment to continue working with UNTAD in establishing credible actions towards the improvement of the population's conditions, well-being, and the creation of opportunities. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Mr. Minister, uh, for joining us and for sharing valuable insights on Angola's experience. This was very, very useful. Thank you, sir, again, for your remarks. Um, I would now like to invite Mr. Hiroshi Kuniyoshi, Deputy to the Director General and a Managing Director of UNIDO, to deliver his statement. Uh, Kuniyoshi-san, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor, Madam Chair. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to represent the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, at this high-level webinar. Our discussions today on the role of productive capacities in the acceleration of structural transformation in least developed countries are of utmost importance. UNIDO stands ready to support LDCs to build back better from the economic destruction of COVID-19. The effects of the pandemic, if not addressed, could put at stake efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. Strengthening knowledge and institutions through adequate policies is essential in building productive capacities for resilient and efficient recovery. In this context, there are several issues that I would like to bring forward. First, there is a need to support the parts of the industry hit most severely and get their financial basis and productive operations back to normal. To do so, it is essential to gather adequate financial, technical, and institutional resources. LDC's focus on building productive capacities can be enhanced through domestic, regional, or global joint partnerships. For instance, last year, UNIDO, together with, with FAO, ILO, ANTA, and UNDP, initiated a major joint effort through the interagency cluster on trade and productive capacity to, pro to provide a rapid response to the COVID-19 challenges. The cluster supports via joint programming, the preservation of rural livelihoods through value chain development and the survival and resilient recovery of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, while transforming business seeds to remain operational through times of crisis and beyond. UNIDO is a willing and eager partner for LDCs in these efforts. Second, policies can act on engines for uh, the development of productive capacities. To achieve this, they should be structured so that industries are more resilient while including environmental and social concerns. A frequently disregarded aspect to this conversation is that social and industrial policy actions are mutually reinforcing. The pursuit of social development objectives sometimes exposes mismatches between government goals and capabilities of domestic firms, thereby highlighting the need for complementary industrial policy interventions. The formulation of policy measures for truly inclusive and sustainable industrial development is therefore a complex task, one that requires foresight, industrial intelligence, industry participation, and engagement of diverse government institutions. UNDO supports LDCs with programs that accompany them with technical advice based on industrial development models and international benchmarking. UNIDO also stands ready to assist LDCs in developing industrial development policy options that are LDC special and consider their position in global value chains, their technological market and investment capacities, 
and wider geopolitical conditions. Third, a new generation of norms and standards are needed to take advantage of the opportunities offered by the fourth industrial revolution. Technology is reaching a new level of complexity, which can create disruptive dynamics, especially for LDCs. The potential of advanced digital technologies can only become successful in LDCs if governments foster skills development and make digital skills development an active part of industrial policies. You need all hearts and will continue to provide resources and assistance to countries in harnessing the opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution. Lastly, countries need to organize their institutions while keeping in mind the threat of global challenges, including those caused by climate change. The pathways for poverty reduction through productive capacities need to respond to the realities of the 21st century. For instance, the use of renewable energies can and should be used to facilitate transformative change in LDCs to prepare the manufacturing sector, including health industries, agribusiness, and agro industries for tomorrow. UNIDO has seen time and again the need for truly sustainable industrial development throughout the world. Technical and regulatory considerations need to go hand in hand for a sustainable structural transformation process. Rest assured that UNIDO will continue to do its part of to support LDCs in this, and that we will continue to join hands with other partners within and outside the United Nations to make sure the Sustainable Development Goals, and particularly SDG 9 on inclusive and sustainable industrialization, are advanced in the region. Thank you very much. I thank you, Mr. Kuni Oshi. Um, thank you for highlighting the various aspects of industrial development policies in the context of LDCs and the importance of capacity building of MSC MSMEs for structural transformation in the LDCs. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Excellencies, now we'll turn to the private sector. And for that, I would like to now invite Mr. Farooq Hassan, uh, President of the Bangladesh Government Manufacturers and Exporters Association, BGMEA, representing one of the most important industries in the country. Mr. Hassan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Chair of the conference, uh, Ambassador Rabah Fatima, fellow panelists, distinguished pan presence, good afternoon to you all. First of uh, it is an honor for me to be a part of this important discussion since ensuring a smoother trans transition from LDC is one of the most crucial issues for Bangladesh. This dialogue is extremely important for us to have a deeper understanding of the issue and make the policy direction accordingly. Before I make my point on the LDC graduation specific issues, let me briefly share with you about the RNG industry and where do we stand today? You are aware that the ready-made garment industry serves as a crucial pillar for Bangladesh economy and its sustained growth. Starting from almost nothing, in four decades, the, this sector has become the second largest garment exporter in the world, contributing immensely in our economic growth and prosperity. With 83% share of our total export earning and contributing 11% GDP RNG sector has become the lifeline of our economy. Over the past decades, the industry proves its capability and resilience not only by earning the trust of global brand and market share, but also transforming itself as a responsible undertaking. From child labor elimination in 1995 till today, we are making many positive change in the area of compliance, safety, well-being of our workers. Over the past eight years, we made a massive effort in transforming the industry in terms of safety, remediation of factories, and creating a culture of safety at workplace. This was done by local and international experts in the area of fire, electrical, and structural safety, was supported by the government, global brand, and development partner, including ILO. Bangladesh is now 
one of the safest and cleanest in terms of development, apparel manufacturing countries in the world. I am proud to mention that Bangladesh is ranked second in ethical manufacturing by a Hong Kong based supply chain compliance solution provider, Huma. The parameter they have been following to measure the ethical audit include hygiene, health and safety, waste management, child and young labor, labor practice, including forced labor, worker representation, disciplinary practice and discrimination, working hours and wages. In this challenging time of COVID, maintaining such level of compliance only testifies our resilience and commitment for the betterment of the worker, industry and community. In addition to this, the footprint of our R&D industry in green industrialization is also remarkable. You will be happy to know that Bangladesh is the home of most lead certified green factories in the world with 145 lead green factories of which 42 are platinum rated. Moreover, 40 of the global top 100 lead green factories are in Bangladesh and 500 more factories are in the pipeline to get their certification. These factories take care of many things like reducing carbon footprint, rainwater harvesting, emission reducing, ensuring safest worker environment. BGME has joined UN Fashion Industry Charter for Climate Action. BGME as the only association in the world is honored with the 2021 USGBC, United States Green Building Council Leadership Award for its exemplary leadership in promoting environmental sustainability and green industrialization in the R&D sector. With all this achievement and continuous effort, Bangladesh is showing its commitment towards sustainability. We have to keep and continue all this transformation and momentum that we have achieved. But most importantly, we need to upgrade our business model. Let me mention for you kind information that our industry is highly concentrated on a few products and few markets and only in cotton items. So we have to upgrade this item. With the dynamic of the world trade regime and ever increasing rare race among the apple manufacturing countries, the competition is getting stiffer every day. Since we have graduated from LDC and the transition period will be end in 2026, it is high time for us to come up with a strategy and action plan in collaboration with the government and stakeholder to ensure a smoother transition. Important to note that 73% of Bangladesh RNG export are covered under preferential market access as an LDC, which will face challenge in tariff regime from 2026. And for you, we will get additional three years as a transition period. The margin of preference will also diminish for Bangladesh product compared to our major competitor countries, especially for Vietnam, since Vietnam has signed a FTA with EU recently. Furthermore, in EU, we enjoy single transformation rules of origin under EBA at this moment. And after the graduation, Bangladesh will require to comply with double transformation rules of origin, which will be difficult for us if we cannot draw required investment in the backward linkage textile industry. Besides the crucial criteria related to import threshold by EU and the UK will come on our way to qualify for the GSP plus not only in EU, but also export to markets like Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, China, Korea, and India, where we ship our goods under partial or full duty-free access as an LDC, will also face challenge. Since our export basket is mostly concentrated in commodity items with less value addition and belongs to lower price segment, and demand for this product is highly elastic to price. Our export companies with potential changes in current export incentive and policy support by the government of Bangladesh also has some implication on our competitiveness. So what is way forward? For us, having the preferential market access like UGSP and other extended at least seven to 10 years is absolutely crucial. On the ground of RNG's high concentration of export and the impact on employment, we need a fair and justified time to prepare ourselves throughout the last 40 years, this sector has benefited millions of women who, if not, might be considered as a burden to the family. This economic opportunity that the RNG sector is providing to around 3 million women has a great, greater significance to SDG. The impact of COVID-19 on trade and economy is to be considered here. The pandemic has brought an unprecedented situation for the 
April industry cancellation, deferred payment, deferred shipment, discount, non payment by buyers, forced loan, buyers bankruptcy, and certainty over payment receivable made the manufacturer suffer from serious financial loss. The industry has lost over $6 billion in export in financial year 2019 20, meaning that the capacity was underutilized. Sudden disruption in the supply chain, like the unavailability of accessories and processing requirement, made the operation inefficient. Uh, all of this increased unit cost of production, while our export price has declined severely in the past few months. I understand that the LDC groups have already made a submission to the WTO for an enhanced transition period for the graduating LDC. It is our expectation the answer can support us in that endeavor to have a multilateral resolution. Moreover, Bangladesh success against terrorism and the sheltering of the Rohingya refugees are to be considered with due importance since trade and employment are linked to maintain peace and stability. Additionally, we have to work on FTAs and explore new market. Bangladesh is yet to have a fully operational bilateral FTA. Through over the last few years, the export market of Bangladesh Apple has started being diversified. Now, talking about productive capacities induced structural in transformation, I must focus on the need for capacity optimization, diversification, and vertical capacity expansion. If we particularly look at our product basket, we see that 74% of our product are cotton based, whereas the current share of global non cotton apparel composition is about 75%. Along with that, we will have to approach newer avenues of cost optimization and being efficient, including modernization of the industry for IR and develop required skills and competitiveness. We would encourage foreign investment, particularly in non cotton textile, high end apparel and in design center. FDI in the design center will certainly create an extra aid for our business and value creation. This thing is presence. Bangladesh RMG is now 83% of our total export. There are few countries in the world with such severe dependency on a particular sector. Losing the benefit, what makes us the second largest exporter in the world will definitely impose a negative impact on the sector and also on the total economy. For a country like Bangladesh, which relies heavily on a few sectors for its export earning, losing market access may bring serious consequences if the industry is not adequately prepared to take challenge of graduation. Given the current scenario of trade completeness and the preference margin, the graduation may bring us to a situation to handle our market and in the industry. So we expect the due empathy and consideration from the trade partner for us to be able to keep our economy on course. We need support from UNTAD, UNIDO, and other agencies of the UN to pursue an extended transition from period multilaterally and would appreciate any possible technical support to formulate the strategy for Bangladesh to better utilize the transition time. Thank you. Thank you for your patient hearing. I thank you, Mr. Hassan, and thank you for sharing your uh, assessment of the impact and prospects of the RMG sector in view of the upcoming graduation of Bangladesh presently foreseen for 2026. Uh, certainly, the industry would need to work with many international partners in this regard. Thank you very much. Um, distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, excellencies, uh, we now will be hearing from the last speaker on our panel this afternoon. It's my pleasure now to call upon Professor Fiona Trigena uh, uh, of DSD slash NRF South African Research Chair in Industrial Development, University of Johannesburg, to make her statement, deliver her remarks. Professor, you have to. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, greetings from Johannesburg um, to the excellencies, distinguished uh, colleagues, and to all the participants. I'm really delighted to be part of this important discussion. Um, uh, perhaps being an academic, I couldn't uh, resist uh, having a few slides. Um, so uh, please bear with me. Um, so I've uh, focused my remarks uh, this afternoon or uh, this morning for, for some people on the relationship between productive capacities on the one hand and uh, structural transformation and industrialization outcomes on the other hand. Um, then the, the topic of, of today's webinar refers to uh, the role of productive capacities in inducing uh, structural transformation. And it's clear that um, strengthening of these productive capacities 
um, has an important role to play in enabling uh, growth and production as well as the upgrading um, of production uh, to greater diversity, uh, sophistication of products, uh, technological intensity, um, and so on. So productive capacities are really key to uh, competitiveness, um, to productivity, um, and to upgrading, um, as well as to firm level productive capabilities, um, which I'll come to in a, a bit more in a moment. Um, I would also suggest that there's a relationship in the other direction as well. So that uh, structural transformation um, and industrialization uh, themselves can contribute to, to productive uh, capacities. And uh, perhaps I should mention that I'm speaking here in a broad conceptual way. Um, I'm aware that in the in UNCTAD's um, productive capacities index, uh, structural transformation is, is one of the components um, of that index. Um, but I think here I'm referring to the, the broad relationship um, between uh, these uh, productive capacities and uh, structural transformation and industrialization. So I would suggest that uh, structural transformation and industrialization themselves um, can uh, contribute to, to building human capital, strengthening the private sector, um, raising demand for and, and uh, improving uh, transport, ICT and other infrastructure, all of these being components of uh, productive capacities. So by industrializing, um, countries can also build up uh, the productive capacity um, at the country level as well as, as below that. And I think uh, conceptually, this perhaps relates to, to learning by doing, uh, that by doing something, uh, in this case, uh, by industrializing um, and by uh, structural transformation, um, there's also a, a, a process of, uh, of learning and of building up of uh, capacities and capabilities and at all levels, ranging from the individual, the firm, the sector, um, and the country. And at the policy level, um, I would argue that um, the, the very practice of um, active in, in industrial policy actually enhances um, government's uh, policy capacity. So by, uh, by the virtue of governments uh, designing, executing, um, adapting, and revising industrial policy, um, state capacity, uh, which forms part of, of productive capacities, um, can actually get better. So we can see this in a way as a, as a, as a two-way relationship, um, which um, if it's, it's not functioning well, um, can become a part of a, a vicious cycle uh, where there are weaknesses on, on, on both sides and uh, can contribute to, to countries um, being in a low-level equilibrium trap. But where there's uh, growth and improvement, both in terms of productive capacities and in terms of structural transformation and industrialization, these can feed into each other as, as part of a virtuous circle um, and can uh, jointly and separately contribute um, to graduation um, and to catching up process by LDCs um, and ultimately to, to sustainable and, and inclusive um, growth and development, including the meeting of, of the SDGs. Um, another way of thinking about this is the relationship between the macro and the micro levels. So the relationship between um, country level productive capacities, which I think is, is what we're mainly thinking about in, in today's webinar, um, and at the micro level, uh, the, the firm level productive capabilities. So in some ways we can see uh, firm level as, as productive, firm level productive capabilities as part of the micro foundations. Um, of, of structural change. Um, and again, I would say this, this is a two-way relationship between the macro and micro levels. Um, it's important uh, for firms to function optimally and, and, to, and to upgrade to have uh, strong and, and improving country-level productive uh, capacities, um, and these can, can feed into each other. Uh, and at the policy level, um, this, of course, requires a whole suite um, of supportive policies. Um, not only in industrial uh, and trade policies or STR policies, which might be some of the first things that, that come to mind, but also supportive macroeconomic policies um, and financial regulatory policies, uh, without which industrial policies are unlikely to be successful. So these, of course, need to be coordinated with uh, a range of policies that relate um, to each of the, the components of uh, productive capacities. Um, and, 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 and to upgrading and to have a coordination uh, between these various uh, sets of policies. 
Um, just very briefly, um, in, in terms of uh, the, the pandemic, I think if anything, it's drawn attention to the importance of um, country level productive capacities, not only for the public health aspects of managing the pandemic, but also for the economic responses. Um, and it's clear that these kind of productive capacities um, cannot be built up overnight. They're really the outcome of policy choices over an extended period of, of time. Um, and we can see that um, both country level productive capacities and, and firm level productive capabilities um, have mattered for economic resilience um, in the face of, of the pandemic. So uh, lastly, um, some aspects of uh, productive capacities um, are of course uh, important across countries. So I thought I it would be important just to, uh, to briefly reflect on some of the specificities um, to LDCs. So in some ways, um, the building up of productive capacities can be seen as uh, most challenging for LDCs, but perhaps it's LDCs where this is, is most, uh, most firmly needed um, to avoid uh, being caught in a, a low level equilibrium trap where weaknesses in the various components of uh, productive capacities feed into each other um, and into outcomes. So it, it's, it's crucial for um, LDCs to, to deal with the, the challenges that in some cases, not in all, um, there's weak uh, manufacturing sectors, both in terms of size and in terms of the level of sophistication. Um, many LDCs are, are late industrializers or even what's been called late, late industrializers. Uh, and in some, we even see cases of uh, what we might call um, pre-industrial deindustrialization. So deindustrialization at very low levels um, of industrialization. So for LDCs, uh, uh, upgrading um, and, and dynamic comparative advantage are absolutely essential. And if anything, uh, the challenges and opportunities brought by the 4IR um, emphasize uh, the importance um, both of keeping pace um, and of catching up uh, for LDCs. Um, the, the, the Productive Capacities Index um, and the gap assessments being undertaken um, by, by UNCTAD, I think provide very useful, um, very practical tools um, for LDCs, um, in particular for, for identifying in, in the specific uh, circumstances of, of individual countries, what are the key binding constraints or the key gaps so that interventions and resources can be focused um, appropriately. We can also see um, the degree of heterogeneity amongst LDCs, um, great differences um, among the countries in terms of uh, levels of growth, levels of structural transformation, levels of productive capacities and so on, which draws attention to the importance of having country specific approaches rather than a one size fits all. And I think the successes um, among some LDCs um, can be seen as demonstrating um, the possibilities. Um, lastly, um, it's, it, it's clear that um, neither growth in productive capacities or structural transformation um, or graduation and, and catching up are things that won't happen automatically. Um, so a business as usual approach um, won't get countries uh, very far. Um, there needs to be uh, specific changes um, and focused efforts um, in order to, to gain the benefits of uh, productive capacities um, and to drive forward a structural transformation agenda. Thank you. I, I thank you, uh, Professor, for providing uh, a very succinct uh, overview uh, of your important research findings and uh, uh, on productive capacities uh, in relation to structural transformation and industrial education. I think there are very useful lessons there for the LDCs, especially for graduating LDCs. Thank you very much, Professor, all of the speakers uh, for your very stimulating and enriching uh, presentations uh, on different aspects of the challenges of developing productive capacities and achieving meaningful structural transformation in LDCs. And now I would like to hand over to Ambassador Bob Bray to conduct the interactive discussions and the rest of the meeting. Bob, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Rabab, and thank you to, uh, to our guests for uh, their uh, very stimulating comments, and uh, and I think it 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 points the way to some of the some of the biggest challenges that we have going forward. Um, we we now have an opportunity for some questions or comments uh, from uh, from any of any of the people who are on the call, but also to ask if there are particular questions or comments. 
that any of the uh, panelists would like to share with other panelists. Uh, this is an open discussion. So uh, really it's, it's, um, it's up to each of you to, to uh, give me an indication by uh, raising your hand on the, uh, uh, as to whether there's some people who would like to come in and, um, and engage. And I shall try to follow this from where, from where I am, if I possibly can. So let me just see what I can do here. Anyway, are there any comments that, that uh, or questions um, that any any of the panelists would like to raise with uh, with each other? I noticed in the chat um, that uh, that in looking at some of the social consequences. Um, a, a comment from BRAC in Bangladesh um, talking about the concentration of female workers among all sectors um, and the importance of getting income in the hands of working mothers. And on the other hand, the impact of COVID-19 in creating greater unemployment, which can result in greater incidence of early marriage and domestic violence. I wonder if uh, Mr. Hassan, perhaps you'd like to comment on that on that comment from uh, your colleague from uh, from BRAC and looking at some of the real consequences of some of the issues you're talking about, the intensity of the transformation that needs to take place over the next while and the way in which uh, the impact of COVID is, is uh, negatively impacted, uh, particularly uh, women workers in the, in the garment trade. Uh, thank you. Uh, basically, you know, in our industry, uh, over 60% are the women workers. And uh, uh, we believe that uh, during the COVID time, uh, we, there are some people, some employees have uh, lost their job, but they are, they have already got back their job because uh, initially uh, for a few months, we were, uh, the factories were not running. Uh, and then uh, the factories are now in operation and last one and a half years, uh, basically all the factories, because of the COVID, uh, the demand was less and uh, uh, there was a less order. So our factories were running in under capacity, but to keep the buyer uh, uh, with us and to keep the factory running and to uh, keep the employment, uh, we have taken order at the uh, below uh, break even cost. And uh, that's, but good thing is that now we have started receiving uh, orders after uh, the Western world have started open, uh, we are getting good orders. So uh, I believe uh, this is a crucial time uh, that we should have some, uh, uh, this transition period uh, should be uh, uh, extended uh, for us so that uh, we can make this opportunity to make more employment and we can take uh, more uh, uh, care of our female workers. Uh, any other questions or comments? It, it occurs to me that really what Mr. Hassan, what you're saying is that it's not to be, not to be, if it, um, take it lightly, but that there's a risk that the milestone becomes a millstone, if you know what I mean, that the graduation, uh, which, which is a, a significant reflection of the growth, uh, and of a greater, greater productive capacity. Uh, and of higher incomes, um, that the transition to that becomes a millstone because it weighs you down because it means that you lose all the benefits of uh, of being the least developed country. And if this is the conundrum, it seems to me we we have to address in the UN system. Uh, and I know that we're going to be addressing it when we talk when we engage in our discussions um, in the program for action because I think it is a central question as to how we ensure that um, graduation does not become uh, a problem, but that it it, be, it becomes much more of a uh, of a of a of a benefit. I see we have another another chat here. Um, Mr. Azad, also from Bangladesh. Bangladeshis, Rabab, were very well represented in this uh, in this discussion. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Um, and it mentions that Bangladesh is at present enjoying better market access and facilities in almost 40 countries. 
but these, if we talked about this graduation issue, um, what would be the possible way out uh, for concluding some free trade agreements and other things in order to have better market access? So there are many problems like inadequacy of readiness, competition, et cetera. So I think uh, Mr. Alvarez talked about this in his presentation as well, that the negotiation of trading agreements uh, may provide some lasting benefit of uh, lower tariffs and um, and better access um, as a um, as a replacement for the kinds of trade benefits that you get from uh, from being an LDC. Any comments on that from any of the panelists, Mr. Kuniyoshi or uh, Professor Tregena? Any any of you would like to comment on that question? Rob. Isabel, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. Just one remark. Um, uh, listening to the presentation of Bangladesh or even Angola, and so the, the, the experience on the ground from, from countries really in the process, um, I would like to, to let you know that, for of course, the PCI, the Productive Capacity Index, is not the panacea. Nevertheless, it could be... Um, a tool which is a little in the UN system as such, I mean, and exactly what's what you have said about the fact that we have to avoid the gap uh, and the middle income gap that that some LDCs are aware, and I, I, we could we could understand that. So I think that this PCI, uh, which which we are we are working on, has also maybe to be upgraded later. Maybe the question this question of women, what what we discussed with Bangladesh, could be added, or other issue that we feel. Um, uh, one of the components of the structural transformation. I know that productive capacity is an old debate in the UN system. Even before I joined the UN, it was it's an old issue. But now it's time to to really um, operationalize it. Not only having an acad with full respect for academic <laughs> please, but I mean more beyond the academic discussion, having something which is replacing the the current system through something which is a process uh, of uh, really a way to assess progressively the progress of the country and to adapt progressively what they could lose in something what they could win. And I think that on that, in UNCTAD, we also we worked on that and we all experience that we have or we can see in the, in the LDC countries candidate for graduation, which could be useful in order to adapt, to upgrade, to really make this system uh, more accurate or but I think that it's one tool which is if it is operationalized and not just a discussion and theoretical discussion and I noticed also what uh, what was said by our academic colleague it's true that it's uh, there was a reciprocity between productive capacity and and transformation and one is feeding the other it's not in one sense it's a two direction uh, issue so on that I think that all the, 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 the information that we could share could help us to, to, to upgrade the system or upgrade the, this index. But I think that this index could be really an interesting tool and even replace some other uh, um, uh, tools in the toolbox of the CDP. That's just a, a, a global remark. Isabel, thank you. Um, I'm going to put Professor Tregan on the spot and uh, ask her to respond in terms of some of the practical implications of the um, of the PCI of the index uh, and how it can you know more effectively be used to actually help countries um, in this in this transition to uh, to a different status um, some suggestion before about trade agreements but I just wanted to get some some response from you on that uh, Fiona if I may Sure. Um, I think a, a part of the, the value of the, the index is benchmarking countries um, against their peers, um, as well as against uh, more advanced economies, um, not just in terms of uh, productive capacity broadly, but in terms of each of the components. Um, so countries can see uh, where they are relatively weak um, in terms of uh, productive capacity. Um, and, and focus their, uh, their policy attention um, and resources on, on some of the weak areas. Um, because although it will never be um, even between the various um, uh, components of, of, the, of the PCI, but it's important to see these components as working hand in hand. 
um, and where there are uh, gaps at, at the country level, um, it can inhibit even the, the role of other uh, strong components in terms of contributing to, to growth and sustainable development. So I think that's one of the values um, of, of the tool, uh, which is very practical for countries. Um, of course, the, the, the data which feeds into the tool is already out there, but the value of the tool is in bringing it together and perhaps focusing minds um, and focusing policies um, on, on where the gaps are. Um, and countries can, can see that themselves relative to countries both at their own level of development um, and those which are perhaps um, a bit ahead and, and celebrate as well the areas in which they are um, performing relatively well. Thanks, Fiona. I don't know, uh, Mr. Fernandez, whether you want to join the discussion just to kind of put you on the spot as well as, is, is, do you feel you're getting enough assistance um, in, in, in working through the practicalities of this transition? Well, thank you uh, for asking me. The thing is, right now, what Angola experienced is that we are, at the same time that we are ch trying to to change our structural economy, we are dealing with the fact that we have to compete with each other. And the thing is, in our region, mainly in Southern Africa, and I see my fellow South African uh, <laughs> neighborhood, we have a different path in terms of um, uh, economies in the, the way they're growing. And some of us are accelerating, some of us are uh, going slower, and the, the levels of development are also different. The thing is, how can one manage to have a um, an agreement that will actually uh, make true for everybody, uh, as well as can accomplish the least developed country to become uh, or to, to to improve their economy at the same time that they are actually competing with those countries which are in a different phase. And what we do in Angola, uh, we concentrate our strategy in seeing what what can we actually right now do in terms of uh, changing the way our economy was um, was about because as you know we were an oil an oil mainly an oil company an oil, an oil country which as you know we suffering from the Dutch disease already and now we are trying to actually uh, make the structural uh, changes and this is the main challenge we have uh, the European Union uh, assisting us in some issues we have also uh, the all the free trade agreements such as this SADC area and also the uh, uh, free trade continental African zone but again as as you know we we are 350 million people at the same place right now and we are all we're eager to trade with each other but the capacity to produce are, aren't the same and the challenge is how if, if it's, is it, for instance, for Angola, is it better to remain a least developed country or we should uh, right now become uh, in the process to, to graduate? I don't know. We will, uh, right now we are in this discussion. Uh, as, at the same time, we are like, this is mainly schizophrenic for everybody, but the main issue for us is to change our structural uh, economy uh, because we need to produce more, we need to trade more, but it has to become within our internal production. Okay. So, uh, Courtney, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, uh, would you have any comment on this? Thank you, Bob. I just wanted to weigh in um, following what Isabel had said, that when we speak about productive capacity with a goal of structural transformation, what she wants to see is something that's more practical and tangible that can be felt on the ground in countries, as opposed to just having, I'd say maybe a conceptual discussion about what structural transformation looks like. And um, I agree with Isabel 100%. You know, it's been a few years now since UNCTAD first published on productive capacity. Um, they have a recent document, but that's not the first time. When we talk about structural 
transformation, you know, Bob, I was scratching my head. And let me just play a little bit of a devil's advocate, maybe to be a bit stimulative in a, in a controversial way. But um, I was scratching my head and saying to myself, you know, is the notion of structural transformation as elusive as the middle income trap is in terms of middle income countries? And there are many of them trying for years to make that, to, you know, to bridge the gap between themselves and developed countries. And I said to myself, is there an example of an LDC that has successfully transformed? And I tell you, I mean, Bangladesh has, I think until 2026, to complete its graduation. But Bangladesh is the only country that I can think of that is an LDC that can be described as having structurally transformed from one that is dependent mostly on agriculture, to one that is now doing quite well in terms of light manufacturing. And even then, I think Rabab and colleagues will agree with me that it still has obviously a ways to go in terms of moving to, you know, manufacturing that is more technologically based than the one that they have right now. But the question I'm asking is when we speak about structural transformation, how evident is it in terms of countries actually having successfully done that? Are we still speaking in conceptual terms or can we put something out there as a model to say, this is something that you can realistically achieve? It's a question. <laughs> Put in the form well, of a statement. It's a good question. Uh, as I would expect from you, Courtney, I think you've stimulated some comment. Isabel, you want to get back in? Yeah, yeah, just because um, what the, the colleague of Angola just said and what uh, Courtney said now, I think that maybe we have also to look at for Africa, that's a big part of the LDCs. Um, we can look the link between the AFCTA, which is also a an agreement with potentially um, or possibly winners and losers. All African countries are not exactly on the same uh, situation. So it's why we we can look how we have to make a, a concrete link between the AFCTA and the goals of the EFCTA and the question of graduation and uh, productive capacity index and productive capacity examples where it shows that some diversification of structural transformation helps to change the situation. And I think that the link between the two for this African LDCs would be an interesting, ex not intellectual exercise, but concrete exercise in order to look at how in Africa for a co coherent zone, even if there are various level of development in the different countries. Just, uh, I add a question, no, no an answer, but a, or an hypothesis for the, for the future. Uh, Kuniyoshi-san, what do you have to say in defense of uh, UNIDOR and uh, the work that's ongoing? You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to say that UNIDOR is fully share the view of UNCTAD uh, that the, the importance of the prioritizing the building maintenance and the use of product capacities uh, for, for transformation of LDCs. And the, but say, uh, from our experience and uh, our say, research work uh, uh, in the past, I'd like to also add the importance of technologies uh, in one of the elements of the uh, productive capacities, say, core elements. And uh, especially thinking about the taking advantage of the post industrial revolution or the addressing the challenges of the climate change and so on the technology is very important uh, and technology is not say something we can say easily say acquire that the capacity for technology so uh, in many cases uh, the manufacturer in manufacturing industries can be the key role of say, advancing the capacity of uh, say, technologies acquirement. And so uh, 
but the, this is not really the uh, something we can get uh, quite uh, quickly. Rather, rather, this uh, accumulation of the technology capacity is a, a gradual process. So having in mind that we need to support uh, LDCs to support their uh, 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 accumulation of uh, technology capacity. Uh, yeah, I think you speak. I think you're speaking there to the need for us to address the digital divide uh, in the program for action. Because unless there is access to uh, education for technology, um, it becomes a, very hard to see how we build up the productive capacity and the institutional uh, building that's required uh, to get us to a point where um, countries and individuals and people can take full advantage of the potential for technological advancement. As I heard uh, Mr. Hassan putting his hand up, but I heard him commenting on this with respect to the fascinating question of what is the future of the of the garment industry in in Bangladesh, and how how do we make sure that Bangladesh is able to take much full, fuller advantage of the potential for uh, tech, technological advancement? Um, it's a fascinating question of how how this uh, how this transfer takes place. Farouk, do you want to get in on this? Yes. Uh, uh... You rightly said uh, Bangladesh, and we are working uh, to upgrade ourselves because you know we uh, Bangladesh is enjoying the golden era of demographic dividend. We have a uh, huge youth, young force, and uh, we ha we are making and uh, we are training them, and we t we need this uh, uh, support to reskill and upskill of our workforce in one way, uh, so that uh, we can uh, have a better productivity and better item. On top of that, we are, uh, in last few years, we have done huge investment in machinery upgradation, process upgradation, and technology upgradation. I, by that way, as I said that Bangladesh, uh, though the second largest Apple exporter, but uh, we have a huge potential and uh, opportunity to grow in the uh, in a non-cotton item, in the man-made fiber, where uh, Bangladesh is still lacking behind. So uh, technology upgradation is a uh, huge area where we need, uh, actually we are working on that innovation and design development. This is the area we are working and we believe that uh, this is the area we can grow and there's a huge opportunity. And uh, uh, we have to make our people more skilled so that we can uh, take full advantage of our demographic dividend uh, region. Good, thank you. I mean, I think it's clear to everyone and there was a comment um, on the chat, you know, indicating that it's important for um, everyone to have a, a strategy with respect to um, uh, technological change and the, and the digital revolution that, that uh, no, no country can afford to be left behind uh, when it comes to uh, the power of this, uh, what they call now the fourth revolution, because the fourth revolution will impact every sector. It will impact agriculture. It will impact manufacturing, it will impact services. Uh, it will have an impact on all, all parts of the economy. Mr. Ak 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 Akiyumi, I see you with a hand up. Very glad to bring you into the conversation. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador and distinguished delegates. I just wanted to contribute a little bit to the discussion on the index because uh, I'm the director who's dealing with this with this index. Um, I'd like to point out, first of all, that this is UNCTAD coined this phrase productive capacity a long time ago, and it's been very theoretical. And this is the first time uh, we developed this index over the last four years, which is a practical tool to benchmark it, as the distinguished professor from South Africa mentioned. The critical, the critical angle of this is that you can actually identify the areas where people need, governments need to focus their policy attention on. And this index also clearly shows that everything is interrelated and everything is interlinked. It is a very practical tool because what happens now Next is that you develop a strategy on how to build that productive capacity based on what the index has told you. And this, as a matter of fact, UNCTAD is already doing in two countries where we've gone through the gap analysis, and now we're going through specifically indicating 
So it's a practical outcome of this whole conceptual idea of productive capacity. And and yes, as the deputy secretary, the, sorry, the uh, secretary general mentioned, acting secretary general mentioned, uh, there is a need to update this index, like there is a need to update all indices in the future, and we will continue to strive to improve it. But one thing we've also seen and is, is that you have to have a holistic approach to uh, uh, productive capacity building and social development, and that is very keen, clear that we are working very closely with the Angolan government, with, with uh, the EU as well, of this holistic approach, tackling all the issues of productive capacity at one particular time to help move the agenda forward. Because as the distinguished uh, 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 colleague from South Africa mentions that we cannot expect to continue as business as usual and expect different results in the future. And this is a new approach on how to do that. So I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, friends. I think we're going to have to bring it to a conclusion. Uh, we've already gone uh, 10 minutes over, um, and I'm very appreciative of the comments and of the uh, and of the dialogue. I think it's contributed a lot to our to our education at a very important moment in the work of the um, of of the group. I wonder. I've, I've seen my friend Perks is uh, is there. I, Perks, do you have anything you would like to add at this point? Because it's, your key role in the uh, development of our program program of action. Uh, thank you, Bob, and uh, thanks everybody for your comment. I have listened very attentively and uh, very appreciative that uh, the, the uh, 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 Mr. Gurus are coming in now and for your information, the Malawi has just taken over the chairmanship of the SADC region. And the theme of uh, the year for Malawi is bolstering productive capacities in the era of COVID. So the, the, the theme of productive capacities, which is the main theme, uh, you can say, in our operations for LDC5 is being appreciated more and more now. I know that uh, the theme of productive capacities was started some time back, but we are ameliorating it with the index now, which was not there before. And uh, policymakers are able, uh, as Paul Agnui has said, policymakers will be able to identify specific areas that need attention. And uh, I want to thank you all. Uh, we may not have mentioned in every chapter the issue of uh, capacity building in our draft uh, document, uh, but it is embedded in all sectors because we need those capacities uh, in all sectors. I want to thank uh, all the participants uh, and uh, my dear friend, uh, Ambassador Robert, and, and, and you, Bob, uh, Courtney, for leading this process uh, throughout. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Perks. Um, I, I want to just conclude the meeting by thanking all of our participants very, very much for their presentations. I think it's been a good discussion and, and the presentations were very, very helpful. And I think we're all beginning to understand better the, the concept of productive capacity and also the important the importance of the tool of the of the uh, of the index. Um, and, and I appreciated very much Paul's um, presentation is intervention because I think it clarifies all of it to all of us that the index is not a theoretical tool. It's actually a very practical way um, in which um, countries can assess where they stand, what they have to do, what 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 are the additional things that need to happen, as well as you know what other countries need to do, donor countries and uh, and UN agencies have to do to make sure that uh, we're actually we're actually making uh, progress. I appreciate it. 
as I always do, um, my friend Courtney's uh, skepticism and head scratching. I think it's a good exercise for us. We sometimes throw acronyms uh, across the uh, digital divide, and we're never quite sure what we're what we're really saying. But it's very, very, very good to to have the combination of hearing from practitioners on the ground uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, Mr. Hassan's presentation very helpful. Mr. Kudayashi from Unidor, um, Mr. Fernandez from the perspective of Angola, I think has really helped to educate us a lot in the directions we need to go. And of course, from Professor Tregena, we really appreciated the, uh, I think the, the importance of understanding the linkages between uh, the transformation process that we want to see. And I, if I may say so, I particularly appreciated your phrase, which I always use, which is learning by doing. We, we have to do things in order to learn, and it's a very important for governments uh, and for the academy uh, and the agencies to be working together so we can figure out all the time uh, how to improve what we're doing, how to make it better. Um, I think the, the, the challenge that we face now with the program for action, just to remind everybody, those who are not totally integrated into our process, we're completing uh, the, in Geneva this week, we're, we're completing the discussion among the regional groups. Uh, we're also hard at work uh, in New York on uh, getting a draft ready uh, for uh, a further discussion for distribution and then discussion. Um, and we're we're moving towards the meeting in Doha in uh, in January. But between now and then, there will have to be many more discussions about how to improve whatever draft um, is um, is ready. Uh, in the next uh, few days, frankly, uh, we're moving um, along in that in that direction. Uh, I, I think this has been a very good discussion. If it makes anybody feel better, um, people have been debating the issue of um, what makes a country rich uh, and what makes other countries poor, and how do poor countries become rich countries uh, for centuries. Um, since the invention of or the, the discussion around political economy, this has been one of the great conundrum questions that everybody has asked themselves. Why, why is this working and why isn't that working? Why are some countries advantaged and others have fallen behind? Um, it's not an academic, it is an academic debate and there's, academic debates are frankly essential for us to advance knowledge and under, understanding. It's also a political debate. If I may say so, it's the debate that led to the creation of UNCTAD. The organization called UNCTAD was created because of a frustration among the developing countries that the Bretton Woods institutions were not responding to the uh, to the needs of the developing world, uh, that it was too slow, and that more needed to be done to understand the gap between the wealthy and uh, and and those who are not so wealthy. Um, and it's this issue of underdevelopment of its structure, uh, how it's how it's been in existence for so long, that has is part of the the dynamic inside the United Nations itself. How do we create the conditions for growth? And now, of course, how do we create conditions for sustainable growth? And the whole development of the SDGs has been about creating a, a, a series of inclusive concepts that deal not only with the economy as a series of numbers and indices, but deal as well with the fact that the economies live in societies and societies um, have other issues of social justice, social advancement, equality between women and men. And now, of course, the broader questions of climate change and sustainability, all of which is happening in the context of the three C's, <laughs> climate change, COVID-19, and unfortunately and tragically, as we've seen, conflict. Uh, and so we need to understand the how this all comes together. But we're going to try to present these challenges in understandable terms uh, to a wider public uh, through the next few weeks uh, in preparation for the Doha conference. So thanks to everybody. Uh, good to see you all, if only virtually. Uh, for me, unfortunately, I can't be in Geneva this week, but it's uh, it's been good to talk to you all, and thank you so much for 
uh, for joining us. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.